who are in attendance. Um, we are, uh, we have a quorum. So I'd like to call this meeting to order at uh, 3.06 p.m. on Saturday, January 16th. And I'd like to do a roll call attendance. So um, Ms. Owen. Here. Ms. Walker. Here. Mr. Vernon Jones. Here. Ms. Ferreira. Here. Ms. Bowman. Here. Okay. Let me put up my screen here. I think I got everybody to this point. Thank you all for, for being here and thank you uh, working group for the ongoing uh, hard work and commitment you're bringing to this, this particular work we're assigned to do by the town uh, through this group. And uh, I'd like to just quickly go over our agenda for today. Uh, we will, as we typically do, um, begin our with our public comment in a moment. And then as we always do, welcome some opening comments from the community safety working group relative to their experiences between meetings, any insights they wanna bring to the meeting that informs our work. And then we'll go right into the uh, action, action and, dis and discussion portion of our meeting, which Today is the second uh, community forum. And uh, at that time, we'll be opening up um, comment, you know, op op opening and welcoming comments from the community, as well as, as the uh, community safety working group as needed. We'll also uh, go up, we'll announce any upcoming events uh, after that particular portion of our meeting is over and we'll establish our next meeting date in addition to um, identifying any items that did not come before the chair uh, within 48 hours of this meeting. And then we will uh, seek to adjourn the meeting at that time. So at this point, I'd like to welcome any public comment from any of our uh, community members attending. Please be reminded that we uh, try to devote about 15 minutes to this process. So I would uh, ask you to govern yourselves accordingly with those with that uh, request. And at this time, I'd like to open it up for public comment. Um, Ms. Moyston will uh, I identify you if you have um, uh, something to say before the for the group. Yes, hello. So Demetria Shabazz has her hand raised. Yes. Hi, D. Hello. Also, the other Dr. Shabazz. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. Um, if this is the time to present something or are we just doing public comment, this is the only time the public has an opportunity to share anything. I'm asking. Oh, so this is just the typical public comment. We're just, we had to post a meeting. So it's just the typical public comment portion of the agenda. And then we will open up in a few moments for the community um, to hear the community's lived experiences. Okay, that's what I was uh, trying to, to understand. I came in, I guess, a bit late. Um, so I will wait and hold my uh, comments until then. Um, I do wanna commend you all for the work you're doing. Um, I think it's still a very tight timeline and unfairly put upon a committee such as yourself that has dedicated uh, uh, themselves to this work. Um, so. I just want to express appreciation and I will wait for uh, the time in which I can share my experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Sean, can you please move Ms. Shabazz over or Dr. Shabazz, sorry, over to the attendees and um, yes. Jackie has her hand raised as well.
Did she come over? Yep. Hi, Ms. Bierce. Do you have a comment for public comment? And I'm certainly committed. I am unmuted. Oh, okay. I'm certainly committed to the to the work. Um, I don't know how to behave on this kind of Zoom, so I don't. There, can you see? You can. Okay. Yes, we can see you. Could Could you hear me? Okay. Yes. Do I Do I keep my video on or turn it off? Uh, whichever you would like. Okay. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I'm 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 sorry. I'm learning the rules. But I'm certainly interested and committed to uh, to this work. And once again, thank you all. That's thank it. you. And um, Councillor Brewer has her hand raised. Yes, thank you. Chair Wiley, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I am here as I was on Wednesday, as many counselors were to listen to your listening session later. But given that this is a public meeting, I just wanted to put a plug in for two things. One is thank you so much for holding two of these in a week, right? Because we know sometimes people could do a Wednesday or Saturday. That's really helpful to have them close together, but at different times of day. And the other comment I wanted to make is as we're all adjusting, continue to adjust to the Zoom reality, it is my firm belief that meetings should not be called to order before participants who have tried to get into the Zoom at the beginning of the meeting are let into the meeting. So not let in as participants, obviously, just as attendees, but the meeting needs to be called to order in public. And the meeting was not called to order in public because many of us who'd been waiting for several minutes prior to three o'clock only were brought into the attendee list well after you'd called the meeting to order and done the roll. So obviously people go in and out of the meeting, but just when you start your meeting, people who are available should be there as well because it's a public meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Brewer. So let's see here. So good evening and welcome to the second Community Safety Working Group Community Forum. For those who do not know me, my name is Jennifer Moyston. I am one of three community participation officers for the town of Amherst, as well as the staff liaison for the community participation for the Community Safety Working Group Committee, Working Group. Here with me today is Sean Hannon, our IT director. And as always, I have a few logistics to go over. This is a safe place and here we will practice confidentiality, compassionate listening, respect, speaking from our own experience, no judgments and no shaming. This is a Zoom webinar. Only the panelists and the community, mem community safety working group members, only the panelists and the community members will be seen. There is no community chat function. Um, please prevent background noise by keeping yourself muted. Click on the microphone on the lower left side of your screen or star six on your phone. Raise your hand if you wish to share your experience. Click on the participants at the bottom of your screen and choose the raise hand icon or star nine on your phone. I would now introduce the community safety working groups. Paul Wiley, chair, Brianna Owen, vice chair, Tashina Bowman, Darius Cage, Deborah Ferreira, Pat Anabaku, Russ Vernon Jones and Alicia Walker. I would like to read the statement of the indigenous heritage of the land. We humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nanatuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nimpmuk, sorry, my screen's in the way, and the Wamapanak to the east, the Mohegan and the Pequot to the south, the Mohegan, Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. I would now like to read the acknowledgement of the contributions of African-Americans written by Amherst resident Lauren Mills. 
Amherst recognizes that the generations of African Americans that have contributed to the development of agricultural and historical academic preservation from past, from the past to the present. We also recognize the rich spiritual culture, artistic contribution and pursuits of justice that have enriched the communities in which African Americans have lived, worked, persevered and achieved. Um, I am now, we are now going to hear a few words from our chair, community safety working group member, Paul Wiley. So welcome again, um, everyone <clears throat> uh, to this community forum. We're, we're happy that you're able to, to attend. Uh, some of you were here on the uh, meeting uh, earlier this week and thank you for attending a second time. Uh, it is our, our, our plan to continue to uh, work closely with this community in terms of gathering information, information. And to that extent, I want to uh, just present an opening comment, I think that will hopefully guide the work of today and even our, our future meetings. So again, we want to welcome our greater Amherst community to the second of two public forums sponsored by this community safety working group, or as we sometimes call ourselves CSWG. Um, these forums have been planned and organized by our group to provide a vehicle for our group to listen to the comments, thoughts, and ideas relative to issues of safety and experiences of community members with our Amherst Police Department. These forums are in keeping with the group's purpose and charge to execute the following. And I wanna take a moment to uh, talk about our purpose and the elements of our charge, which I wanna say are also available for you to review on our our website, um, our town website, um, under the uh, Community Safety Working Group uh, portal. The, the purpose of our Community Safety Working Group is to uh, do two things, make recommendations on alternative ways of providing public safety services to the community and make recommendations on reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures of the Amherst Police Department. Our charge is very explicit and very detailed. We are charged with studying the complex issues of delivering community safety services currently provided through the public, through the uh, police department and other means to ensure racial equity. The specifics under that topic are as follows. We are here to recommend reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures within our town. We are charged with examining existing town funding priorities for delivering community safety services. And we can best achieve this by doing the following, learning from previous work by the town through previous studies and committees, examining current public uh, safety services and how they are delivered, reviewing policies, complaints, and current training practices, exploring models of resident resident oversight of police departments, collecting data from people's experiences in Amherst. And I wanna say this is one of those opportunities that uh, for people to do such. Engaging the communities most impacted by policing to develop alternatives and identify solutions to diagnose problems. And finally, we are investigating alternative models such as and this is not, this is just a partial list because since the time I had actually written this, this proposal with my colleagues here, I mean, this presentation by my colleagues, we have certainly expanded our research into looking at different models. But the three we began with were the Eugene, uh, uh, Oregon crisis assistance helping out on the street called Cahoots, Albuquerque community safety alternative, Denver Star, support team assisted response. The CSWG has been meeting weekly on Wednesday since the first week in December, with the exception of the last week in December 2020 to fulfill its duties to respons and responsibilities to the town of Amherst. 
Our meetings are recorded and open to the public following open meeting law guidelines. You can find our agenda and links to the weekly Zoom meetings on the Town of Amherst website at www.amherstmass.gov. <clears throat> Both forums that we've held are being facilitated by Jennifer Moyston, who we appreciate the contribution of her time and expertise to this process. The CWG will present questions, which you will see in a moment uh, being presented on, on the screen, to serve as conversation prompts for those who wish to speak. We offer these questions to broaden the arena of response, responses and comments. They are not presented as a fixed list of specific questions to be answered separately. Our hope is that this open-ended approach will provide a useful and supportive space for sharing. Ms. Moyston will keep track of each person's speaking time to ensure that everyone has a fair opportunity to express their views to the group. That being said, we have decided to hear from BIPOC or Black Indigenous People of Color voices first. Although we decided to hear from people of traditionally marginalized populations first, please trust that we do want to hear and plan to take seriously input from everyone present today. While we will not be responding to comments from the community, our role will be to listen deeply and respectfully to what is being offered and to use this feedback to inform our work going forward. We have allotted two hours for these forums. This forum will be recorded as, a, as, as was the others and posted on our town website within the CSWG's portal where they may be accessed by the community. Again, uh, we want to welcome you to our first forum and we look forward to learning from you in the two hours we spend together and we all thank you for your attendance. I do wanna say before we go to the questions and open it up for the forum, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the, the expertise on our, our community safety working group and their ongoing efforts to, to be committed and show their commitment to the, the work that needs to be done in our community. All of us are here for the purpose of doing that work and each one of the folks in on our group has made major contributions in the few weeks we've been together, uh, although it'd be a short time. And they, uh, I appreciate as the chair being able to work with such a fine group and all the efforts they're putting forward. And I don't expect as they agree, agree with me, anything less than the best we can offer. So uh, thank you to the group again uh, for all your work and your commitment. And thank you all for being in attendance today at this particular forum. And like to turn it back over to Ms. Moyston and perhaps we can maybe present the, show people the questions and then invite people to speak. <clears throat> so while I, I, I still have an open mic here, I wanna say these are the questions we felt would be uh, important prompts for us to consider going forward. They, again, they are not presented to confine your responses, but certainly allow you a, 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 an opening or a broad palette from which to talk about what you'd like to, what your experiences are and to share those with the community. So I'll give you a moment to refer to, to read those through. And then uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Moyston, as soon as you see hands that want to be recognized, I would like for you to open the, the comments for form. Sure. So Mr. Ashwin Ravikumar, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name.
Hello, I hope you all can hear me. Is that all right? Cool. Um, my name is Ashwin Ravi Kumar. Um, I live in Amherst and I teach at Amherst College. Um, so first of all, thank you all so much for your hard work on this committee. Um, I also serve on the Energy and Climate Action Committee of the town of Amherst, so I know uh, how much extra time goes into doing this work and the work that you're doing is tremendously important here. Um, so personally, as a person of color living and working in Amherst, I do not feel um, like the police make me safe. I find the police to be a threatening force. When I see a cop, I feel scared and I feel unsafe. Um, and I hope that this committee will make really strong and really bold recommendations to the town to defund the police and to reallocate resources into peer led crisis responses, along with other services that are accountable to the people who are most impacted by policing and also serve their needs. All right. Um, and the good news, and there's just a couple things that I want to flag here. The good news, I think, is that there's a lot of work being done um, in other towns around the valley. Uh, some of which I've been involved in, especially in Northampton. Um, and there's a bunch of resources that uh, I would be happy to share via email um, about mobile crisis response, uh, peer-led resources, um, and experts that might be willing to speak directly with you. Um, so to, to name a few, um, I would encourage you all to check out uh, <clears throat> MH First in Sacramento, which to my mind is one of the greatest models of how to do this kind of work. Um, you know, it's great that you're looking at CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon, and the STAR program in Denver. Uh, in Northampton, organizers that I've been working with actually brought Vinny Cervantes in from Dasher slash the STAR program in Denver to speak with us about his experience. And one of the things he highlighted was how if he could do it all over again, uh, he would have made sure to never involve the police at all. Uh, CAHOOTS has actually collaborated a lot with cops, but we've actually heard a lot of testimonies about how social services programs like ServiceNet and CSO um, when they collaborate with cops, end up deploying violent carceral logics against the very people that they seek to deliver alternatives to. So it's absolutely vital that the police be completely outside of any process that you recommend. And there's some great examples um, that I can point you to. <clears throat> Another great program is in Toronto. Rachel Bromberg spoke with the Northampton uh, Commission about her work. I can send you a link to that talk. I highly recommend watching it. Um, because there's some great specific information there about how to build a program that does what the police cannot. Um, so a couple just standards that I hope you will be uh, implementing, and I am I, I admit that I'm uninformed about the like antecedents of this conversation. I have not been following closely the work of this committee, um, so I don't know how much of this stuff you've already discussed, but making sure that any program is not controlled by the police, that it is truly independent is the first thing making sure that peer-led programs are emphasized over all other approaches because those are the most empowering approaches. So peer-led approaches to um, people, for, to serve people who use drugs, uh, unhoused people, um, and to address all kinds of other needs um, is kind of the gold standard. And uh, finally, <clears throat> I would just say that um, it's absolutely essential in to answer the question of what changes would I like to see recommended uh, and uh, what would it take to build trust and confidence among black and brown people in Amherst that were being provided with equal protection? For me, the answer, uh, the only way to build trust is by defunding the police and reducing the frequency at which I see and interact with cops. We have to reduce the footprint of the police altogether. That means no more funding for extra training. Training doesn't work. No more funding for body cams. That stuff doesn't work. Instead, we need to absolutely decrease the footprint of the cops and replace um, some of the stuff that they that they are tasked with doing that they do not do uh, with great with excellent peer led services um, and simply eliminate a lot of the unnecessary criminalization that they carry out, which is a lot of what they do. Um, and just one final note I would make is uh, serving on the Energy and Climate Action uh, Committee, we are tasked with decarbonizing, uh, reducing the carbon footprint of the town of Amherst. There is one staff person in the town of Amherst tasked with all things environmental sustainability. Meanwhile, we have dozens of cops who are paid to enforce a white supremacist social order. That's obscene. We need to reallocate massively the resources that we have in the town so that our budgetary priorities match our stated values. Thank you so much. And I'd be really happy to talk with any of you more and to provide other resources. Thank you. And, um... Professor Tyson Rose.
Hello, good afternoon. How's everyone doing today? Um, I want to thank you all again um, for, for doing this work, for taking on an additional role um, in hopefully to uh, transform the society, right? Um, I know many of you, and I know many of you, this, this is more than just a day-to-day -day thing that you do. This is actual life work. So I want to appreciate you all for doing this work. And for those of you who are listening, um, I hope that you take a moment to um, listen deeply um, and to um, consider everything that everyone is saying. Um, so, you know, I want to thank um, the, the previous um, guest on here. That was amazing. Um, perfect um, statement. Um, and I am in, in full agreement with, with everything um, that was stated. Um, and so I'm not going to I'm not going to add on to, to those kinds of things. But what I would like to do is really talk a little bit more about the experiences um, that uh, myself and others have experienced um, with the police in um, Amherst. So um, I live I lived in Amherst from 2008 until 2020. Um, and during that time, I had many interactions with the police. I worked for UMass. I was a graduate student in UMass, then worked for UMass. Um, but I also um, worked as the assistant residential director for the A Better Chance House in Amherst and got a, a chance to witness firsthand um, the interactions that the police have with not only young people of color, but also um, professional um, people of color in, in the city. And um, I wanna sort of give a couple of quick anecdotes, but I wanna wrap this together because I think one of the most important things that we need to do is we need to understand what is the purpose of policing? Where did it evolve from? And as the prior panelist mentioned, it is intended to support a white supremacist society. Um, and until we begin to rectify and understand that, we can talk about reform, we can talk about training, we can talk about all of these things, we can throw social justice around for days and nothing will change because we're not changing the culture surrounding policing. And so all of these anecdotes, these, these individual um, um, run-ins with police are grounded and formed from that cultural context. So I think it's extremely important to, to understand that. So um, in my time here, I have had a lot of um, run-ins with, with police, um, you know, um, those that are, that are okay and those that are horrible. Um, and I wanna share in my time coming, in coming to Amherst from other places, um, this is something that we need to understand that it doesn't matter what town the police are in, they're still police. Um, they are still cops. They are still intended to do something. They are part of the thin blue wall between, you know, havoc and chaos in, in, in law and order. And as we all have seen very recently, law and order gets um, interpreted in different ways depending upon who the person is that is part of the process, right? Um, and so just to uh, give a, a quick, you know, anecdote about that is I, I remember being pulled over one night on, on my way home actually going back, I was around the corner from the ABC house when I worked there and I was pulled over. It was late at night. Um, and while the end result of the, of the encounter was, was um, you know, wasn't violent, wasn't any of those things. What I, what I remarked mostly from that is the, the, police's, uh, the police officer's inability to understand why I was nervous, why I was scared, why I would not move without asking him, sir, can I lean over and get my, my uh, insurance papers? They're over here, um, not taking my hands off of the wheel. And he continued, even though I was doing everything, he continued, so well, you don't have to do all of that stuff. You know, we, we're, we're uh, community policing. And I said, sir, you don't understand the context here. And he continued to keep on pushing, continue to keep on pushing, continue to try and sell me on the fact that they're somehow different. Although my experiences of, you know, close to 40 years as a black man on this planet is that that is not the case. And the problem that I really received from that is the fact that he continued to discount my experience, to continue, continue to discount my beliefs, continue to discount nor hear as I told him, you know what, sir, that's fine. Can I just, can we just move on? Can we just, and continue to berate me about this throughout this entire time, right? It's problematic because he has a belief that they're somehow different, that his experiences should define my experience. That's the problem right there, right? And so 
that's only one of my own. But what I really wanna focus on is some of the experiences that some of the young people um, who I worked with and lived with um, in the ABC house experienced um, with the police. Um, the first, my first time when I did work uh, at the ABC house, uh, we, we have the majority of our students don't, they don't come, they're not local, right? And so they have to take the bus back and forth to their homes, whether that's in New York or in Connecticut or even points further, right? Um, and one of our 14 year old students um, was trying to go home. Um, for some reason, there was an issue with the ID and him not being able to, you know, be on the on the bus without a, you know, all of these kinds of easy issues that, that could have been handled, right? A phone call to us as the, you know, as his local parents, his local guardians could have been able to resolve the situation. But the police were called. They show up and the police officer decided that it was a good idea to threaten this young man and tell him, go ahead, take a punch, take a punch, right? Go ahead, I'll let you take one, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Try and rile up this young person to do something that could possibly put his life in danger, right? That's real, that happened, that's on the record, right? These are the types of problems. And so going back to the person who talked previously is that the police do not, they don't operate for us, right? The amount of times that I've been pulled over on campus or off for no apparent reasons. And when I ask them, you know, why am I being pulled over? They immediately go to the next thing of give me your information. And I'm as a, as a person who knows his legal rights, then beginning to go through the process, I'm, I don't need to do anything until you tell me why you pulled me over. And then it escalates. And then guess who has to step back? Guess who has to suck it up? Guess who has to be reminded again and again that you don't have the same rights? Your rights go only as far as I tell you they go, right? So the dehumanizing effect that this happens, um, that, 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 that occurs to, to us is part of the problem. And that is part of the culture of policing in a white supremacist society, right? They're not here to protect and serve us. They are here to protect and serve the others from us. And policing as a means of continued segregation, of continued dehumanization, continued intimidation is part of the culture of policing in this society. Until we grapple with that, until we grapple with the fact that we just had a white mob attack the Capitol building, yet we all know that if those folks looked like us, there would have been bodies in the street. There's no question about this. And so when thinking about what we may think of doing, we do need to consider new structures. We need to consider how this system has worked. It is not redeemable, it is not recoverable. And what are we going to do in order to create something new that makes that old system obsolete? I think that is our task here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tyson Rose. And next is Dr. D. Shabazz. Oh, D, you're muted. Okay. We're good? Yes. All right. So I just want to preface with, uh, so we don't have to dial in from another room that the other Dr. Shabazz also wants to participate. So if you could bear with us and have a few minutes for each Dr. Shabazz's, I'd appreciate it. Um, so first off, you know, this, this group is really important in that it's the first step of uh, this community it's in its initial step. It's a very first step in hearing the voices of the BIPOC community because we are the ones, uh, racial equity task force included, that pushed for something as this working group. Obviously it's not um, ideally what we um, had considered, but you are here and I appreciate the work that you're doing still lots to do. I would say um, that what is missing at this moment, unless you all can clarify for me, 
is um, a similar focus group our focus groups to go where the people are, meaning in the apartments um, where folks live that might not have the same privileges of connectivity that we are enjoying right now. In addition to have similar focus groups um, where translation is available, Spanish language translation and Khmer uh, and other languages that would be important in terms of populations for this community. Because certainly isn't the only folks who are being, you know, targeted uh, or stopped in this community are many immigrant uh, sisters and brothers. And so um, I would ask that uh, the same effort is put forward to those uh, community groups and uh, populations. So I want to reemphasize um, what was said about the mobile units, mobile crisis response units for wellness checks, uh, mental health calls. Um, I know firsthand uh, within you know, my community, friends and family, that this would be something if it were available and needed people would be less hesitant to call upon these services. As it stands now, I have, you know, been there for people in the community who have been deathly afraid of calling the EMS and the police when a wellness check was needed and appropriate and when mental health was the issue. And so that pains me to know that folks in the community that need these types of services that would benefit from these types of services, particularly during a time of quarantine and COVID where we're all cloistered together, that they will not call because of the fear of what might result, okay? So, you know, shifting money to, from uh, one of the largest budgets in terms of this town from policing into an area that we so desperately need and the five colleges, particularly UMass, Hampshire College, Amherst College uh, would be able to benefit from and hopefully add to because many of our students are suffering from mental illness or have, um, you know, uh, uh, drug addiction problems or what, ha what have you, that this would benefit the community as a whole. But I can tell you now, people of color are deathly afraid of calling on the EMS and the police when it comes to mental health crises, okay? Um, the other thing, you know, I just have to tell you, I fear for my sons. I have a son in his uh, 20s, I have a 15 year old, and when I send them out there, um, you know, even in this idyllic, what we see is this idyllic community, I, I'm always worried, are they gonna be stopped just because of how they look, who they are, as, as friendly and as sweet as my boys are and all the other young men I have encountered in this town have been just wonderful, wonderful young men. But I know because they're, again, my family and friends, these young men have been stopped because they have been targeted. They have been profiled. My son has been stopped he has been profiled. So no matter how we send them out into the world as mothers and fathers and guardians, they come back changed because of their encounters with policing in this community. So I really ask, you know, is this a community that we want uh, to remain? Is this a community that we want to have going forward? or will we create change? I myself, and you could see how I look, it doesn't matter, I have been stopped. 
And I have been stopped not only uh, by police uh, that are part of the town, but I've been stopped by UMass. So, you know, this isn't a conversation that needs to just take place within town policing, but UMass police needs to be a part of this. I was stopped twice just trying to park in a paid parking spot at UMass. And once the, the policeman said he followed me from a stop sign that I, that I didn't stop. And not to say I don't make mistakes, but my family could tell you that I adhere to, you know, um, to irritation of stopping at stop signs and stoplights. So it was very strange because the policeman got behind my vehicle uh, and in a crouching position as if I was going to come out of my vehicle shooting. So it was very shocking. That happened in the parking space at U on UMass's campus. Another time I was going to my parking spot and the policeman stops me. And when I asked, why are you stopping me? He says, well, your license plate uh, is about to expire. So I, I asked him, I said, so you stopped me because it's about to expire, but it hasn't expired. He says, yes. I said, you've done this, you do this as a service for everybody just to remind them or why, you know? And then he asked me, your vehicle is, it's registered to the mill car Shabazz, who is he to you? Now he has my license in his hand. He can definitely hopefully uh, read it. I'm Dimitri Arujo Shabazz. So these things have happened to me. So when I hear town council members who were on this Zoom call, when I hear your colleagues say things such as, well, I don't believe those experiences. Let me tell you, these experiences are real. And if you really wanna make change in this town and do what you've been elected to do, we need to change it now. So I'll let the other Dr. Shabazz speak. Okay, I, I want to uh, come at one particular thing that um, was just raised and wonder if you can incorporate it in your report and incorporate it in your um, activities. And that is the UMass Police Department. Um, I know the topics here and the questions here are all directed at Amherst Police Department, but we're one town and we pay taxes in one town. And if UMass is gonna be, is a part of this town, how do we get accountability about the UMass Police? Since the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, I have had a number of calls, emails, contacts to me. And to be honest with you, all of the cases uh, in terms of police issues, all of them involved the UMass police. Maybe one was Amherst Police Department, but all of them were UMass police. So how does the town and how, do, how can this working group also speak to the issues of that force, which is actually a larger force than the Amherst Police Department so that we can all be safe, okay? And these cases, I I can tell you, I followed up on all of them. I um, was asked to help and, and, and I did what I could. And I spoke with uh, Chief Tyrone Parham on at least half of them, uh, on a number of them. And I got his side, I got his view. Basically, he asked me if the person would step forward and come and talk to them. I got back to the people that I'd heard from. They were not interested in going down to, to, uh, to, to, to speak with Chief Parham. I said I'd even accompany them, but they had no interest. And, and these weren't all cases of African-Americans. One of them was uh, specifically a case of a non-African-American woman that um, uh, had, a, had a, a negative encounter with new UMass police. So I don't know what you can do or what you can include in your report, but again, we're one town. And if, uh, if this other force is also a source of problem, how, are we, how can we speak to the problems coming from that force as well? And I, and I say all of this knowing the chief of, of both departments, uh, knowing them both as good professional uh, uh, people who are trying to do good jobs, but again, there are issues and um, this is not my job. I have a job, I have a very busy job. I don't have the, the time to go and, and just because 
my name is out there as a public figure or whatever to, to, to run down all of these different cases that come my way. So anything you can do on the UMass one, I'd appreciate it. Finally, I wanna acknowledge that this is incredibly complex problem, incredibly complex work um, around the um, Christmas Eve toward the end of, uh, um, of December. Coming from Atkins Farm to my home, I um, collided with a deer. Deer jumped out. I could not stop in time. I collided with the deer. Knocked the deer to the ground, but the deer got up and ran off. I was concerned that, that the injury that the deer sustained, something might happen. It could be out and, and attack or, or whatever. Uh, I was concerned for the deer, concerned for people who might encounter that deer. Uh, I looked for a while. A person who stopped behind me looked as well, um, but the deer was gone. So when I got home, despite all the concerns that uh, D just were, my partner just raised, all the concerns I have personally, I did call Amherst Police Department. I didn't know who else to call. I don't know, know any other uh, animal control was definitely closed. It was in the evening and it was like Christmas Eve or so. So I did call. And I must say, the person that came out was very empathetic, was very cordial. Um, I felt put at ease by the way they spoke to me and by the way they um, um, responded to my call. Um, they filed a report, they had a crash, gave me a crash number uh, um, so that they called in to the desk to get a crash number so that I could file uh, a use for my insurance purposes very professional, very cordial, and I will say as well, was a person of African descent, was an African-American police officer. Now, all of that being said, doesn't mean that I am speaking against what Professor Tyson Rose just said or the previous caller, but in fact, it highlights how incredibly complicated, nuanced, and, and, and difficult these issues are. The force is, the, and, and the nature of policing is what Professor Rose said. And yet within it, there can be people and can be times in which the, uh, the persons wearing that badge and carrying that gun are not, in, are, are not in every moment and in every instance trying to uh, uh, enforce a white supremacist uh, a culture and a white supremacist society, domination. So it is complicated, but the work you're doing, you cannot get it all done. This has to be ongoing. You have to recommend a commission on police practices that is ongoing because it's not, it's, this is not a one and done thing. If you do it like that and the, and the racial profiling thing that, I, that Alyssa Brewer was supposedly on at one time and, and that goes on for a little while and then it's one and done, we'll be back here or uh, in this situation a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, maybe even in worse context than now. So it can't be one and done. You're gonna to have to recommend an ongoing commission on police practices. And I say again, Chief Livingstone welcomed the creation of this body back in the summer. Why aren't we already on it is what I can't understand. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Mrs. and Mr. Dr. Shabazz. And um, now we have Jonathan, who has his hand raised? Um, hi, folks. Can I, am I heard? Okay, thank you. Um, I want to say thanks to the committee members and the community members who've spoken so far. Um, I know that uh, movement fatigue is real. And so I just, I'm just naming, I really appreciate your ongoing work. I know this is hard. Um, I'm really humbled by some of the wisdom and the experiences that were already shared here um, by earlier speakers. And uh, I want to echo calls heard earlier to sort of expand the scope of this body to looking into community relations with the UMass police. Um, and echo the call for an appointment of an ongoing um, commission on police practices. Um, 
And then I want to speak more to kind of another specific issue, and, I, and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so we know that in the history of, of far right political movements, like the one we saw perform really egregious acts of violence in DC last week and ongoing all across the country throughout our history, um, in the history of these far right movements, complicity on the part of law enforcement <clears throat> and others who are entrusted with our, our state monopoly on violence is a huge part of the success or failure of these far right movements. We know also historically that law enforcement is applied much more strongly against um, leftist and civil rights movements than against right wing or far right ones. Um, I think Professor Rose spoke to this when he said, we all know that um, if it had been people of color uh, committing those acts on January 6th, the police response would have been much more violent and much greater. Um, <clears throat> and, and I know that leaders in our town, some of whom are here on this call, um, who mostly, it, it has to be said, share a, a higher level of class and racial privilege. Um, I know that they themselves feel and perhaps their peer groups feel that they have good relations with the police. Um, but I ask you this question, how well can the rest of us rely on that, on those good relations? Um, and for the leaders that are willing to listen, we've heard a lot of stories here today. You said this summer that you didn't believe the stories you heard. Um, I, I'm asking you to, to try and appreciate the emotional labor and the personal risk that folks who have spoken on the call today have taken to come to the table to share their experiences again um, and to educate you because um, you didn't believe the stories you heard this summer. Um, and I wanna draw that connection to another part of what Professor Rose said about sitting, the experience of sitting in his, his driver's seat with his hands on a steering wheel, feeling that it was his job in that, in that moment to feel safe, to do the emotional labor of making the police officer feel safe. <clears throat> And I, I, wanna, I wanna draw that parallel to what you're asking residents to do by coming forward and speaking to a body like this. Um, so I, I appreciate the courage of those who've spoken. So I'm gonna speak to an immediate and urgent ask of this body right now. Um, Off-duty police officers from all over the country, including officers from Boston and Saugus are right now under investigation for their particip participation in the attempted coup on January 6th. Um, <clears throat> A caravan of right-wing partisans left Western Massachusetts um, from the Holyoke Mall uh, ahead of those events headed for DC. So I'm asking this body um, to raise this issue with the town manager, town council. Um, while I read and appreciated the statement from the town manager and the superintendent, um, I, I really feel they didn't go far enough and they were not strong enough. So I'm asking this body to ask the town manager and town council to conspicuously and publicly demonstrate Amherst's civilian oversight of policing by releasing a joint statement with the chief and the APD, guaranteeing that no Amherst police officers were present at the Capitol on January 6th, nor did any APD officers participate in any of the illegal and dangerous activity that happened in Washington, DC that day. Um, this ask uh, speaks to, you know, I can't speak to the black or brown experience in Amherst as a white man. Um, and I'm not trying to do that in any way. Um, but I think the ask that I've made here speaks to um, the potential to build trust. And um, there are so many and so many complex things happening and um, issues that need consideration as Dr. Shabazz, um, Amokar Shabazz spoke to. Um, but this feels particularly urgent in this moment, given where we're at politically um, as a nation. So thank you all for your time. And uh, again, I really appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. And next, Ms. Lydia Irons.
Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, hi, my name is Lydia Irons, and um, I just want to um, echo what everyone has said. Uh, deep thanks for this working group um, and all of the energy and effort that you're putting into in looking at policing here in Amherst. Um, I'm coming to this meeting as a member of Defund 413 Amherst um, to uh, offer all of our um, information that we gathered this past summer before the budget meetings. So um, I wanna remind everyone on this um, call that there was um, 52 people that participated in two different budget meetings calling for um, a reduce of the, the Amherst Police Department budget. And um, we had took really detailed notes of all of, um, hold on one second, my uh, toddler is, Hi, sorry about that. I'm trying to find a place in my house that's quiet. Um, okay, there we go. So um, I wanted to just share a couple quick things from those meetings. And again, I just would hope that this working group would take into consideration the um, 52 people that did speak out about their experiences with police. If the town does not have those um, uh, those um, statements on record, we took record of them and we would be happy to share them with you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share here on this call is that during those, um, during the calls over the summer for the budget meeting um, and defunding the police, one of the things that was really important was that we um, have a lot of data that shows where the police um, spend their money and also where the police spend their time, including maps of how they uh, police different parts of Amherst differently. Um, those maps show that they spend a majority of their time uh, in, the, in and around the apartment complexes um, and that they spend a lot of their time, um, a majority amount of their calls are um, for mental health um, crises. And there's been a lot of research uh, about that uh, police responding to mental health crises do not um, lower the risk of anyone involved as um, Ashwin spoke to earlier. So I, like I said, we have a lot of this information written and documented, this data that we have collected that we would be happy to share with you um, for this working group. But um, on a personal note, I have had a couple of interactions with Amherst police since I've been living here for um, over a decade now. And the, the thing that I feel like I would really love this working group to hear is two, two things. My personal experience with Amherst police has been um, uh, maybe, let's see, about six years ago, a friend of mine got lost in the woods outside of, um, in the uh, Amethyst Brook area. And when we did call the police to try to help find her, um, I was alone to go and meet them. And the Amherst Police Department officers were, uh, there was a lot of really painful things thrown around about women being alone, women getting lost in the woods. And there was also a lot of um, really harmful things that were said to me about my emotional response to my friend being lost at night in the woods. Um, they also called off looking for my friend after they found that her car was unlocked and that um, uh, they kind of seemed to make a judgment call that, oh, she was a, you know, not taking good care of herself, so we don't need to go looking for her. Um, so that's one experience that I've had with the police here in this town. Um, and I also want to speak to my experience with working inside of a uh, working in the town council meetings. I've heard multiple times the town councilors speak to what good people the police are, that our police are above par, 
I've also heard specific town councilors say that they are not ready to defund the police in our town, that they are not ready to look at what policing could be different in this town when there was, like I said, 52 um, Amherst residents came forward to say that they had had ne negative experiences with the police in our town and that they wished that a um, larger percentage of the budget was not spent on policing. Um, and to hear again and again from the town council that they don't believe that they are not ready is um, makes me feel uh, very disheartened. I also, the last thing I want to say is that this working group there, um, I can see already from the town manager and members of the town council, they're putting a lot on you. I can, I have heard in town council meetings, well, we'll discuss policing again when the community safety working group comes back to us with what they have um, with, with their report. And I am really, really hopeful that they will listen to your report, but I also, I would also, um, I want you to know that that the the town citizens and the activists and the people who showed up for this call, we will also rally around your report. So if the town council reads it, sees it, and doesn't take it into consideration, especially around our budget, reducing police numbers, changing police practices, having more civilian oversight is concerned. If they back away from that, if they waffle on that. That, that we can and will continue to mobilize for this cause. So thank you again so much for your time and for everyone who's spoken. Thank you very much. And does anyone else have a comment? And I have another Lydia. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, I'm another Lydia, Lydia Spiegel. Um, and I want to thank everybody for their commitment and participation today. Um, I'm coming here completely new, no affiliation to, to any group. I'm coming as a mother and, and just a citizen of Amherst and a mother of two boys, uh, one white, one black. And so having seen, experiencing um, very different ways and uh, and uh, connection with with um, experiences with uh, authority and police around the town of Amherst um, directly through my children and, and friends and families affiliated. Um, I wanted to um, you know address uh, maybe come with a, an example of um, you know hearing about wanting to decrease the footprint of the, the police in town for sure. And, and, um, and looking for uh, ways, ideas, solution on how to, to have them be more approachable and non-threatening um, police authority, by the way they, they appear or, or the impact that it has then on, um, on the, the youth more specifically, but on anyone hearing of everybody's experiences. Um, I guess I, got, I wanted to bring an example of, uh, of, of uh, middle school children playing around in town, um, just two of them, maybe doing a little mis maneuver and, um, and the police officer being called upon that in the center of town, uh, coming with you know, the cruiser with the lights on and stopping to apparently, uh, tried to, to just talk with these two kids that were maybe you know 13, 14 years old. Um, 
next thing you know, there are another cruiser and another cruiser stopping in the middle of town. One of the children one my, was my child. Um, they hadn't actually done anything wrong. I heard from that, uh, from my child not being called. And this is just an example, not parents not being, uh, being called in. Um, uh, and a couple of other instances like that. Um, wanting to, I guess two things. One of them, uh, seeing the, the impact it has on the, on the victim, on the child. And then the impact that it has on the on the um, on siders, on people seeing it, what perceptions are, uh, you know, keep going on. If, if something like that happened in town, it, it makes a big spectacle. What do people? We can control what people are thinking, how it's portrayed. And a few times I went uh, to the police station. Um, to try to explain the experience. I was talked to respectfully, I'm a white woman, I come in, people listen to, but that piece of not, um, of just knowing or seeing the officer would not just get it, why this was just outrageous. There's no need to, to deploy such a thing. There's, um, no need to have uh, or the, the, the level of intimidation that they bring upon and a level of uh, threatening to uh, to the people and um, and and that goes you know with other examples of and I guess I want to address the, the way that just the, the officers look and appear and that it goes on in the schools I don't know where where that is now with the school system but uh, officers moving along with all their attire um, so I guess a question there of within the police, if, uh, within their service or, or, or a separate one, how can that be changed? Um, there's the place also of the being able to safely report things. Um, it is, it does take a lot to, for one to decide to go up to the police station and go again through all that and, and talking with people. And again, I'm a white woman who's, gonna be looked at or, or listened to in a different way. And I strongly believe that. Um, but it brings that piece of where, um, where there can be, or there's a need to, where do we report that? If not to Dr. Shabazz, who was saying he's not wanting to play that role. Where is there a, a place, a safe place, that's not the police, um, that people can report Did we just lose Miss Lydia? Yeah, it looks like she got disconnected. Okay. Um, so we can call in the next person and then if Miss Lydia comes back after our next speaker, then we can allow her to come back in. Um, so our next speaker is Councillor Brewer. I'm sorry, thank you. I know that we were making a point <clears> of <throat> not having counselors speak, if at all possible, and certainly as a white counselor, I did not wish to do so. But I did want to just make one modification to something that was stated earlier. There was a previous police stops committee. As a representative town meeting member, I assume I voted in the favor of, as the majority of representative town meeting did back in 2004 to establish a police stops committee. It had a fairly simple charge, which was to create a single one page form that did some demographic tra tracking, the kinds of things we think are really obvious now, but many people were not doing back in 2004. I was not part of the select board that set the charge up for that committee after town meeting's action. I was not part of the appointing authority for that committee. That committee had a majority of people of color, including representatives from the Human Rights Commission. And as far as I can tell from town records, which are often spotty in certain places, basically nothing happened. And the committee was eventually disbanded. The committee just eventually faded away. And so I very much appreciate all the comments that people have made about the fact that this is not a once and done process. This is an ongoing thing. This is not, this is not one group of people's burden to bear 
for a period of time, but it is all of our responsibility to ensure that it is something we look at. While I was not responsible for the police stops committee, I am ashamed of the fact that I did not press the town manager at the time to say, what did you find out from that? That I did not say, please have the police chief come and explain to us how they have changed things because of that town meeting action. Instead, I deferred to the fact that I had not heard from any committee members that they were dissatisfied. I had not heard from any community members that they were dissatisfied. And I'm ashamed to say that I let it go. I have no intention at this stage of life of letting things go. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Brewer. And next, Ludmila Pavlava Gillum. Hello, um, is this a good time to speak as not a member of a BIPOC community? I'm sorry. So we've, yep, so we've asked that the BIPOC community speak first. Exactly. Yeah. So can you tell us when it's time to speak when if we're not a member of the BIPOC community? Yes. Thank and, you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Angelica Castro. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Everyone, I think Paul's hand was up. I don't know, uh, Paul, did you wanna say something? Okay, all right. So hello to, um, to the committee and I'm happy to see a lot of my fellow community members and friends here on the committee. Um, so I uh, echo a lot of what's been said, um, but I just wanted to, um, just from myself recount uh, a couple of stories, personal stories. Um, and, you know, I thought about speaking as it would be, would be helpful, would not be helpful, but it just, I can only speak from my experience. So I have um, four children who identify as BIPOC children who the world sees as black boys and men. Um, and the first, incident I can remember, um, my 16 year old, so unfortunately these two incidents, I'm going to name is that I had to call the police on my own kids, which is hard to say as a mother of color. Um, but I had a situation where my oldest who's 24 and I was 16. And um, there was some issues that he didn't want to go to school and he ran away and it was just basically, it was a hard time. And so I called the school to see if they had a truancy officer because um, he was actually at that point refusing to go to school and they said they didn't have a truancy officer unfortunately and uh, my dean friend recommended they call the police and they might be able to be helpful. I did call the police. Um, someone came to my door who stood at like 6'6". Six, six. I was like whoa. <laughs> And it was actually really helpful. He was very, um, a good conversation. He had asked some really great questions. I felt um, that was really, at the time as a mom, kind of at a loss of what to do, had a great conversation. He went to the back to talk to my 16 year old because he was outside. I wasn't letting him in the house. And he just, um, I just felt like, the conversation was really positive um, to the point where my child did end up going back to school. Um, part of it was positive, but we also came up with some little bit of scare tactics. Like, I mean, like, you know, if you don't do this, you know, you can possibly, you know, if you don't continue to do some of the things you're on track to do. But I think what, you know, then this might happen. But I think what I really appreciated was the police officer used really kind of positive, a really positive tactic where, you know, um, I, I know that you're part of the basketball team. I know that you're, you know, four, your three younger brothers look up to you. Um, you don't want to do this. And so they just had a really heart to heart talk. That was really helpful. Um, and then again, my second son, who's 22, my second child, actually, who's 22 now, 
when he was 16, same thing. We had an issue. He went outside really angry. And I called the police just because I was scared he was going to hurt himself. He was um, kind of at a place where he was really angry. And he was by a couple of my car and um, ex-husband's car. So I didn't know if he, you know, just didn't want him to hurt himself. Three police officers came. And um, it was, again, another really positive experience. I, I didn't, again, at a loss for what to do. I was scared. Um, they just really talked to him and a really, I felt a really like loving, really kind of um, comforting way. Um, they calmed him down. They said, you know, do you want us to um, just let you go back inside and will everything be okay? Or do you want us to stay and kind of ask me, my son? He was fine. He came in and we, things, you know, settled. Um, I got a call back from them just to check if everything was okay. And I said, yes, everything was fine. Um, one of the other situations that happened was, um, or that I wanted to name was, uh, there was a police officer that actually um, volunteered to coach uh, my, second, my second child that I talked about, coached um, their basketball basketball team for I think three years and so sometimes he would come in uniform and coach sometimes he would just come in uniform because he was working and just wanted to check on the team um, my child that I'm talking about um, had a lot of respect for him um, we had a lot of times had talks about um, you know police officers and their role and so I think that was a really positive um, a moment to have a positive uh, model, role modeling. Um, and I bring those up just because I feel like, you know, when you think about community building, like how to build community trust with, with um, authority and police officers, I wish that we saw that more often, right? Like more instances where they were present in a positive way. Um, um, and, and present in kids' lives in a way that you can see police officers as not scary or the things that people hear. Um, and so, and I mean, honestly, again, I've heard a lot of stories, I have friends and, you know, so this is not to kind of um, dismiss things that have been shared, but I just say for me as someone who has raised um, my, my 24 and 22 year old were one and three when I moved to Amherst. Um, and I raised them here. Um, and so I have four children, 24, 22, 16, and 13. And so, um, and so I, those are the situations I've had. I haven't had any negative situations outside of that. Um, and that's not to say anything, um, again, dismiss what anyone said, but I'm just speaking from my experience. So again, I just wanted to bring that up to, not to counter, but just to also use that as, you know, again, encouragement for the Amherst Police Department to have more opportunities that they show up in the community um, in ways that are really helpful um, and, and role modeling. So those, I just, that's what I wanted to share. And I think again, the committee, which a lot of, I see a lot of my friends um, for the work that you all are doing. Thank you, Angelica. And are there any more questions from the audience? And did Miss Lydia, was she able to come to get back on? Yes, she's there. I'll bring her back in now. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hi. Am I on? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened technologically here. Um, and I also apologize for, uh, I didn't hear that piece about the member of the non bipoc community to, to wait for a turn later. Um, so I forget where I was cut off, but um, I think there was a, a place where I was bringing up the, a need to have to have a reporting place that can be other than the police for when somebody experience or witnesses incidents in town. And that can be a place that where things get recorded and, and, uh, and kept and um, um, maybe help sorting through how to then process it from there. And the, those were the, the main the main things and also the the importance of the, the collecting the data um, but also finding a way or not finding I wonder how there is a way to share it more um, you know we're talking about anecdotes and all these illustrations that talk so vividly when when we hear people and they, yet people would say but I'm not being heard or the story is not being heard or people dismiss it um, and I don't know how there is a, a way to to be able to share more of those with the white community in town, um, where I'm always surprised that if I bring up an anecdote or somebody's illustration, how many times the the still surprise around it, or you know that's happening in my town, um, and. Um, and I'm sure work has been done around how to try to share it, but but how uh, to reach to reach the homes. You know, if somebody's if it's not in the workplace, somebody's not connected with a, with a group with people who are working, and many of you are directly involved. I'm talking for greater population, white population, parents who are then talking with their kids um, as a way to be able to hear more and not to the point where you just hear and, and you're not questioning because there's numbers, there's, there's a lot of examples that are other than the one that might appear in the newspaper or that is a greater example, but all those, um, all those stories that are so important to share and to be known and to be, um, and that people can then need to be uh, accounted for. Thank you. Thank you. And are there any mother, any other attendees that would like to speak? Ms. Lisa Pierce Boniface. Um, I am not a member of the BIPOC community, so I'm willing to to step back until that, that time is available. I wasn't quite clear on that. And I'm going to refer to the chair for that. I apologize. I actually couldn't hear that. I was actually going to ask if the volume could be turned up on her response. I was getting a very soft response. I could hardly hear the comment. So I apologize on this end if it's on me. Um, my comment was just um, if this is not the time for someone who's not part of the BIPOC community, I don't mind stepping down and waiting. I, I think based on what I think in terms of the hand raising piece, I think there's one one more additional comment by a BIPOC person. And then I would ask um, Ms. Moyston to invite you in right after that comment, if you don't mind, if that's okay with you as well. Thank you. You would be you'd be next after this this acceptance of this call. And Ms. Moyston, I think there was someone else that was non-BIPOC who had also, 
Ludmila. Yes. Yeah. And so we don't see it. Um, I believe it's Ashwin would like to come back. Hey, I know I already spoke, but I just I feel I feel compelled to add something in light of a couple of the recent comments. Um, so this is this is pretty vulnerable for me to share. Um, I'm a non-black person of color, um, which is important uh, for this for what I'm about to share. Um, but when I was a teenager, I grew up in a suburb, uh, upper, upper middle class, relatively white, largely white suburb. Um, and I would get into trouble sometimes as a teenager. Uh, and my parents have ca had called the cops on me a few times. Uh, for various things that kind of are similar to my mind for um, to, to what we heard from one of the previous speakers. Um, and when that kind of thing would happen, I remember being terrified, being scared, and then sitting there quietly and nodding while the cop affected a supportive presence, and then moving on with my life and even perhaps kowtowing to their suggestions because my parents had invoked the final violent authority of the state to bring me to heal. They did so because they didn't have community tools at their disposal, because they didn't have good alternatives that they knew about to bring real healing and real support to me. And if my parents were to share that experience at a commission as a positive reason for why cops are like good, despite all of the history that we know about, despite the movement that has emerged this summer for black lives calling to not train cops, do community policing, but to defund the police and build real institutions for community safety, I would be absolutely horrified and absolutely mortified based on how traumatic it was for me to have to deal with that as a teenager. So I just felt compelled to share that counterpoint from my own experience, and I will leave it there. And are there any other members from the BIPOC community that would like to speak? Um, Miss Angelica Castro. I would just like to agree with the point that I think there were no, for me, in terms of tools at my disposal as a mom who was going through what I was going through. I think, um, when we, again, thinking about community policing or community um, tools uh, when things happen. Um, and like I said, when I called the school, even uh, a friend of mine who was a dean, the recommendation was to call the police. So I think, I, you know, I would support that, right? That I think when something happens and there are no other tools, um, what do you do? And so I just wanted to, I just felt led to, to agree with that. So thank you. Thank you. And any other BIPOC community members? Okay. I'm going to move on to Miss Lumia Pavlava Gilham. Oh, you're muted and and somehow sideways. I... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I wanted to speak to the experience of my two children who both grew up as boys in Amherst. My youngest one is 17, he's still growing, and the older is 29. My oldest son was um, a hockey player, very um, happy in the high school, um, very happy with and appreciative of the work that police was doing in town. Um, there was one time when he got in trouble and instead of walking away from the trouble the way his, some of his friends did, he walked toward the policeman who arrived on the scene. And when he came home with the policeman, we were worried, but um, we thought the police handled the situation very well. Um, and then as he got older and went to University of Massachusetts Amherst, he, and grew a beard and was riding a moped, his experience as a young adult 
with the police was different. Um, he was um, a security guard at LIT. And one night there was an altercation with some uh, students who were misbehaving. One of his buddies who was uh, an African-American who lives in Springfield was trying to defuse the situation. They ended up having to take um, a patron outside who was attacking the security, um, uh, the two of them as security representatives with a knife. Um, someone called the police. The white person who was the part of the, who was actually the cause of the problem ran down and uh, ran down the street in the center of Amherst and addressed the policeman and told them that he was being attacked by the black security person. When the police uh, came up to Cameron and his friend or colleague, um, they immediately arrested the African American and didn't hear the whole story on the spot. Um, they it took him, I think, a number of months to come out from under the suspicion that he was the one who was attacking a white patron, rather than being, in fact, someone trying to defuse a situation and being put in a very precarious and physically dangerous position by a drunk patron. So my son was traumatized by this experience um, that the Amherst police responded in this way and were so obviously um, racist, honestly, in the way that they um, assumed the white person was telling the truth. He, um, I think since then, he's been very careful driving through, we live in North Amherst, so he would drive back from Lit through the University of Massachusetts. And I support what uh, Mr. Shabazz was saying earlier that there really does need to be coordination between the university and between the town um, police because he was targeted many times, watched very carefully, stopped supposedly because he was um, crossing a line being a young man, a young white man with a big beard, driving through the university at two o'clock in the morning, coming back from lit, um, he just felt that he was always under watch and that the police were looking for a reason to arrest him rather than watching over him to make sure that he was safe. Um, I would like, I, I appreciate a lot of the comments that I heard earlier and certainly would support um, the establishment of a board that could monitor and facilitate a changing of culture so that um, the police might address some of these issues. In one other case, he was stopped by a UMass policeman who accused him, he was on a moped. And the, the law is different for a motorcycle than from a moped. He had a registered motorcycle. He was driving on the side of the road the policeman who stopped him and arrested him, arrested him um, gave him a ticket and it, he didn't deserve it. He challenged it over the course of four months and it cost him to challenge it. And finally he got clarity in court, but the policeman didn't know the, the, rule, the law. He basically saw a young man with a backpack with a big beard on a motorcycle, what they thought was a motorcycle. And uh, arrested him a couple of times. He used to carry the court paper in his back pocket while riding his moped because he was afraid that he would get uh, stopped and arrested again by the same officer. So I think there are definitely officers who are problematic on the police force, both um, at, in Amherst and in the University of Massachusetts Police Department but it's very difficult for us to address those issues if there is no formal mediation process. Um, my youngest son has lived with his brother's experiences, both as someone who admired and um, truly appreciated the work that the police do as safety and guardians, um, and then who lost his faith, so to speak, who got seriously discouraged by the practices that he saw as he became an adult. And when we were talking about how he felt after the events over the last few months, with um, especially after what happened at the Capitol, 
I asked him, what is the problem that you see in, and are most afraid of? And he said, toxic masculinity. That's a lot for a 17 year old to think about. So I would like to support this committee's work and anything that you can do to facilitate um, improving the culture of police in town. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, Lisa? Thank you, can everyone hear me? Great, my name is Lisa Pierce Bonifaz. I wanna thank each member of this safety committee for being a part of this. I know it's an incredible amount of time on, on your part and it says a lot about your dedication to this town and, and loving your community. Um, I'm hesitant on ex, you know, talking about my own experience just because I understand you know, so deeply that this is nothing compared to what other people experience. But I, I felt like when this did happen to me, it was um, September 7th, 19, uh, 2015, um, it was the UMass police. So I do want to um, just speak to what the Dr. Dr. Dish and, and Amil Shabazz spoke about, about it being UMass as being part of the problem as well. And I just felt like if this could happen to me, and I took this all the way to court because I felt like if this could happen to me, it could happen to somebody else and it needed to be stopped. And I had no ability to make anything change. So for that reason alone, I'm so glad that this committee is here and you are, are able to listen to these experiences because there isn't any place to go with these experiences except for to go to the UMass courts where you are already stated you've done something wrong and, and they really are not there to support you. So I'll just explain the story. Um, Southwest Circle um, on campus on the 7th of September was a very hot day. A lot of students had just come back to school. So everybody's nerves were on edge. And I think, I can't remember who it was exactly who had been in the media for being killed African-American being killed by the, by, by the police department, um, I was on edge as well. And when I saw this police officer behind me, I quickly wanted to do something. Like I thought he needed to get around me or something. So I, I saw him behind me and I approached cautiously this pedestrian stop and I didn't, I stopped there. He didn't do anything. So I went to, I guess it was like a blinking red light. And I think I passed through that red light because I thought he wanted to get away. Uh, he wanted to get around me or he was going somewhere because he was kind of tailing me and nothing happened. And so at that intersection, you can actually have to turn left again onto Fearing Street, I think it is. And he was still following me very close behind and um, his light started to go off. And so I was gonna try to pull over, but I couldn't pull over. There was very little shoulder and so I had to go to the next street over and turn. Um, and at that point, um, I noticed that his lights were flashing and he wanted me to pull over. There was no shoulder and I turned into the next street. Um, and then I waited and before he approached my car, but I saw through the rear view mirror that he was talking on his walkie talkie, probably taking in my license number. Two minutes later, he came over to my car and said, driver's license and ID, please. And as I went to retrieve them, um, he said, you know, it's mass state law that you're supposed to stop for emergency vehicles and pull to the side immediately when they indicate that you should stop. I told him I was un unaware and I wanted to stop, but I couldn't turn over because there wasn't a place for me to turn. And he bellowed back, I decide where you should pull over, not you. I stayed quiet after that. I said, I was sorry. He told me, do yourself a favor and get rid of all these prior registrations that I had given to him. I don't need any of these. Then he said he would be back in a minute. At that point, I called my husband because I was really scared or I called him on, the, I texted him. He said, just get the ticket. Don't ask him any more questions. And I could feel his hostility, very red faced man. I have his name if anybody wants it. His name is um, Professor Slaughter. 
And um, he said, um, I, I had to ask him why, excuse me, sir, but why am I being pulled over? And he said, failure to stop at a stop, at a stop sign. He came back five minutes later with my ID and registration, turned the ticket upside down and warned me to stop immediately when an emergency vehicle wants to get past. Otherwise, you know what I would have to do to you. You know what I would have to do to you. I looked in shock. Was he saying he should shoot me or arrest me or convict me for fleeing from an officer? I decided to stay quiet and get a ticket. And I did go to court. I went to court the first time and I was interrogated by two police officers who sat me in a room by myself and made me tell my story, but they made me say I was guilty before I even said anything. So I couldn't really say anything. I, was, I felt like I was being interrogated. <laughs> and then I went back for my second hearing and the police officer was at the door of the courts. And as I was walking in, I had to pass right by him and he gave me this really dirty look. And I went into the court and he started chatting with the, with the court judge and sat behind where the court judges were sitting. And then he came back out and sat down but you could tell he was chummy with the, with the judge. So all of these, I ended up having to pay over $250. I never got the courage to tell the judge how I felt intimidated by him because he read his own um, prediction of what had gone wrong and he was kind of angry in the court, but the judge just took what he said and I barely said anything. So I just felt like this whole experience made me realize that um, this isn't fair for anyone. It's, I bet it's less fair for people who are of color. And I just wanted somewhere to tell this story and I've never been able to tell it to anybody. So thank you for listening. I'm done. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? And Mr. Tem Blessed. Here, hey everybody, good, uh, good evening. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, my, uh, my first reaction is uh, I'm sorry you, you had to go through, through that. I just got a chance to hear the end of, of the story. Um, um, and I apologize, I'm on my phone, so I can't see the name of the woman who just uh, spoke, person who just spoke. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really sad. I think the only thing I have to add um, to this conversation, I have a, a, a bunch of sad, but I'm, I don't want to take too much time, is um, what I feel I've, um, experience. That's what I studied in uh, going to school at UMass Amherst um, and graduating with a degree in legal studies and also having survived a, a police attack uh, um, some years back is, you know, that this system. Um, Mr. Bless. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Let me see if that's that is is that better by any chance? Mm -hmm. It's better. A little better. Okay, great. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I have a house full of uh, kids here, and everybody seems to be on Wi-Fi right now. Um, so um, yeah, um, I don't know how much y'all heard, but I'll try to keep it brief by saying, you know, I went to UMass Amherst, got a degree in legal studies, have worked in the community as an activist and an artist. Um, I have survived a police attack myself some years back. And um, I really, oh my God, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I, I just wanted to hop on here and uh, sorry for the technical issues. But, um, you know, it's a systemic issue. And I guess I, I just want to cut to the chase and to say that, you know, we got to remember that we're all human beings here, all trying to. Uh, live our lives and we all understand that police and court people and judges and all these folks um, are in positions of power and, it, and it's great that you all have worked um, hard to get in those positions. 
but know that we're all human beings. You're, you're human just like I am. And when someone is dealing with an issue, like the woman who just spoke earlier and is, is trying to tell her story, like have some compassion, man. Like, you know, like, you know, when I got charged and eventually, you know, all the charges were dropped and I was in the courtroom, it became really apparent to me and everybody else that was going through this experience that, that this, everybody knew what was happening. Everybody knew that these charges were, were fabricated by this police. Everybody knew that these police had assaulted me and they were, they were wrong, but it was almost like we had to go through this terrible movie, this terrible act. And the judge was there and the, you know, the, the district attorney was there and they all knew it. Like, you know, they had been through this already so, so many times. But for whatever reason, I had to go through this to prove some type of crazy point to them that, you know, like, I guess I had to learn some type of lesson. But years later, the lesson is that, you know, police need to do a better job. They need to have more compassion. They need to have more training. They need to um, be trained in order to be police and not have this chip on their shoulder um, and need to really learn how to de-escalate the situation. Because at the end of the day, there's so many people that have to deal with um, situations that they shouldn't have to. And luckily I had the, the words, I had the support of my family, I had the support of my community and I had resources, but it cost me $12,000. You know, I'll never forget that figure. $12,000 for them to finally drop all the charges. And it cost me a lot. It cost my family a lot of, of time and anguish. And I bet you those police officers still working there, still continuing to do what, what they're doing. And so the system has to change. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for each and every one of you all that are in this, in this call to do what you all are doing. And, you know, to any police that might be listening to this, you know, if, if you're a good cop, like, you know, step up, have the courage um, to arrest. I, I'm, I'm waiting for the day when a police officer sees another police officer doing something wrong and actually arrest that police officer for committing a crime. That, that will be the day when I, I feel like, you know, good police officers have shown up. And, 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 you know, I'm not naive to know that, I know that some police officers have tried to talk and say stuff and they get, you know, um, some of them lose their jobs because they stand up to the system. So it's a systemic issue. I'll leave it at that um, because I know there's other people that probably want to want to speak. And I just uh, applaud you all for the, what the work that you all are doing. And, you know, I live in a community and I'm committed to changing the, the system and changing the way because the way that things are done, because I mean, we're dealing with a pandemic, look what's happening to our democracy. There's a lot going on y'all. And, you know, if police just honored their oath, um, I think things would change. And if judges would honor the oath and DAs would honor the oath, you know, it, it's it's all connected. So thank you. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Are there any more comments? Do we have other people that want to speak? This no, person? we don't at this moment. I was waiting to see if someone was going to raise their hands. So I was looking at the time as well. And oh, we have a hand raised. Mr. Ferreira. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I didn't know I had to raise my hands to tell you the truth. So. Um, I know I know it's almost five o'clock and the advertisement said it was five o'clock. So I know most of you guys here and most of you guys know me. And to be totally transparent, um, I just, you know, heard a few folks and Tam is blessed, is my brother. He just, you know, I'm not gonna change my name to blessed. I'm gonna keep it forever myself. And uh, to be in transparency, Deborah is my sister. So just wanna make sure that um, the transparency is out there. But all you guys, um, most of the folks in here, I know them, well, I know of them. So, and Pat was my daughter's first, you know, babysitter. 
So it's always good. And she's 29 by now, Pat. So to make a long story short, uh, I would echo what my brother said. Um, thank you for doing this work. This is important work and it's not easy work to do. Um, in my line of work at UMass Amherst, I do work with UNPD and I know everything that is going on in, uh, in uh, the student realm concerning this, this piece. But to, you know, to, to go quickly, um, you know, member of the community, been a member of this community for over 35 years uh, with my student years at UMass, even though I'm only 27. So you guys do the math. Um, and, oh, actually I was also Jennifer Moisson's uh, advisor at one point. Dang, there's a lot of connections in here. Um, so, you know, I, I have to say that uh, my experience with the police um, personally, I have not, I've not had an encounter with the police myself in this town, but as my brother has um, so eloquently stated and a bunch of other people, um, they have had, right? And, uh, and I know exactly what he's talking about because, you know, I'm social justice educator and we know that this is a systemic issue that needs to be changed. However, talking from my own experiences, I think that one of the reasons why I haven't had any um, problems in the community is because I'm relationship based, right? Um, that's why I know most of you guys. So a lot of people know me, right? And, um, and most of the, uh, the cops at UMass and in town know me, right? Um, and I say that not to brag, I say that because I truly believe in community policing. You getting to know your community, right? because it's a lot less, you're a lot less likely to harm someone that you know and you care about, right? A police force should be community-based with law enforcement powers and not the, other, not the other way around, right? It should be actually serve and protect, not protect and serve, you know? Um, but right now they're not even, the way that things go on nationally is that we don't even seem like they're serving anyone these days, right? As per a lot of what we've seen in the, in the, in the media these days. We have a police force, and I'm not saying this about MSPD, but I've seen it all around because I don't know all the, the, the training and the, um, the stuff, the toys that MPD, you, uh, APD has, but we have a police force that is militarized, right? A police force that the training is straight up out of, um, military tactics and that has been going on for the longest time we do also have some a lot of times a police force that we do have you know for better for worse a lot of veterans that come straight out of a military um uh, system right and then when you bring people that come out of military system and then you train them in military um tactics they're going to act like that right so you know training Training the uh, the way that the training has to be done has to change. We have over eighteen thousand police departments in this country. We have I don't know how many you know people in the police department. And if you go over to all these eighteen thousand police departments in the country, each one of them may have a different type of training. Right? I've been involved in police interviews where it was straight up scary. Some of the people who applied. And I turned around to another cop and I said, hey, uh, you know, I'm, that, that person was pretty scary, but I'm afraid that he will get um, a job somewhere. And you know what he said? He said, you're right, Sid, right? So for us to have people who are scary because there's no uniform standards. If you don't have uniform standards, that's what's going to happen. You know, it's every person for themselves. Right? And that's what is happening these days is we have a militarized police force that the training is really not about the community, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it's about, it's almost like survival, right? And we see that, especially when it comes to these shootings of, of mostly black and brown folks that we see out there. And we have a lot of trans transgender folks that we know are getting shot and a lot of people that are in that social economic area that is very low than everybody else that are getting shot. And it's almost like a survival that the cops are going into certain situations expecting that they're going to draw the guns and that they, they're going to defend themselves so much so that anything in their hands become weapons. But we all know 
who those people are, right? Because as we saw in the Capitol just a few months ago, there's a lot of people with a lot of stuff in their hands that did not get shot, right? So we know, we know what that is. So again, training, training, training. Um, but for me, it's all about relationships uh, based. Some of you guys who are on, on this call know that I'm a huge, huge supporter of having um, our police force. You know, I'm pretty sure you guys are gonna make a lot of recommendation, but if I could make one recommendation here myself would be for us to have outreach um, um, police to, to all of the communities that we have in town. We have, I'm Cape Verdean, we have a Cape Verdean community. We have a Cambodian, Vietnamese, Puerto Rican, uh, Dominican, Laotian, um, you Bhut Bhutanese, you know, Guatemalan, you name it. Yes, we need to have, you know, outreach folks from the police to connect with these communities. They need to get to know those communities. They need to get to know who are the folks that they can talk to in those communities, because believe me, these elders who are here, I know a lot of you, you know, so I call you guys elders, but you guys are because I respect you guys as such. If Paul was to tell me something, I will listen to them. Pat was to tell me something, I'll listen to her. If Russ was to tell me something, I'll listen to, to him, right? Because they have, they have stature in the community where I know that if they tell me something, it's for my own need. They have street cred, right? And that's what we need a lot of times is to have these police, police uh, community police officers go into these communities, figure out who these people are, who in the community, it could be your grandmother, it could be your godmother, it could be your mom, your dad, your godfather, who has that street cred that can then, you know, connect with these police officers to make sure that we have a system that is working for those, for those communities, right? I mean, I know there's a bunch of other stuff that recommendations that, that can be made, but that would be, you know, my Sid's personal recommendation for this group was to have outreach folks for all of these communities. And I know people are gonna talk about budgets, they're gonna talk about this, that, that, and that. that that's all well and good, right? Uh, we have budgets for a lot of things. We need to have budgets for this stuff too, right? Um, and outreach to our youth. You know, our youth is, is one of the most important things. I mean, if you talk to our youth, Everyone is having different types of experiences um, in in the high schools, in the middle schools, in in the you know junior high schools. You know, I'm most of you guys know I'm I'm here at the ABC program, and um, you know, fortunately, my young men who are here have not had any encounter with the police the last five years that we're here. But you know, when we sit at the dinner table, they tell me stories that they hear from from their peers that have had those those uh, those encounters. So. You know, what are we doing with our youth to make sure that we minimize those encounters that those negative encounters that our youth are having with our police officers? Um, I know it's five o'clock. I know some of you guys got family members and all this other stuff, but I'm here and um, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, anytime you guys want to reach out to me and hear some more of my thoughts and ideas, I am more than willing to contribute any way that I can. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you, everyone. Ferreira. Thanks for your service. Cheers. And Mr. Wiley? Oh, I believe Tashina had something to say. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of just tell, just make a point to the committee that we now had, I don't remember if it's three or four people, I think four now, have talked about their experience with UMass Police, and I really think that we need to take that, that information seriously. Um, and so I'm gonna just put that out there that, um, honey, can you not use your scissors, please? Because last time you messed everything up. Can you wait a minute? Um, hold one minute, please. Please wait. Let me finish one thing. Sorry, you guys. Um, so I really just wanted to put that out there. Also, um, just in recognizing that um, there may be people within 
the committee themselves who have had experiences. So I, I don't know if we're, I, I'm wondering if we should make time to talk about those um, sorts of things as well. Um, and I really wanted to commend everybody who shared today um, because it, it's really, really important uh, for us to have all of that information and have all of those suggestions as we move forward on, on this committee. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I will also wanted to chime in to, um, like Ms. Bowman said, you know, just wanted to thank everyone who took their time. You know, it's a Saturday. It's, you know, it's a day that you could be do, uh, doing other things, but instead you chose to um, be here, be here now, uh, be part of this community and try to make this community a stronger community. Um, and I know that it's not easy. It's, it's difficult to kind of get here and to be brave to, to talk about your lived experiences or to talk about how to make this community a better place. Um, and one of the things that I want to do as part of this, um, you know, uh, working group is, you know, and I'm sure my other community uh, members, community working group members want to do it too, is to follow up with people because a lot of people said a lot of wonderful things and shared a lot of resources. And I think we need to follow up with folks um, individually and try to get a lot of those resources and links. And, you know, if you have other information, please feel free to share it with us. Uh, other ideas, ways to make things better. Um, and the fact that obviously it's not, it, it can't be just with us, right? This, this, you know, has to be ongoing work, it has to be everyone involved, um, you know, because, you know, a change needs to happen. Uh, so just thank, thank folks again, um, you know, and obviously we're taking all of this in, taking it all to heart and, um, you know, ready to make some, some, some good changes. So Ms. Moyston, it's, it seems like we've come to the end of the, the time that people have wanted to make comment uh, with respect to the forum. I, I do want to defer to the, uh, you know, the working group at this moment uh, with um, respect to what uh, Ms. Ferreira said and Ms. Bowman had to say. I wanted to see if anybody on our working group has any closing comments. I'd, I'd like to move to the next agenda item but I, I don't want to miss an opportunity to hear from uh, our folks here on the committee, either in response to this, this community forum or any thoughts you know, related to, to, to the work that we have. And then I, I'd like to move on to upcoming events. So I'd like to open it up for a couple of minutes to our, our, um, our working group. Uh, Ms. Anoni Baku? You're on mute, no, Ms. Pat. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just want to thank uh, all of you for coming out to um, share your experiences and offer suggestions for us. I, I know your time is very valuable and I really appreciate you coming out. That's all I want to say. And like um, Deborah stated, we would like to follow up uh, with you or if you have additional um, input you can give us, you can always uh, also email us. Um, you can get the link through the uh, MS Town website, but thank you all for supporting us. I'm just gonna go around the screen just to make sure I don't miss anyone. Uh, Ms. Walker, any, any closing comments you wanna make, please? If not, fine, but. Yes, I just also wanna thank all the participants here today for their bravery um, and for sharing anything that they shared with us that anything that was said is greatly valued and will be used to inform work moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Owen. I also just wanted to say thank you to everybody that came out today to share different ideas and experiences with us. I urge all of you guys to continue to follow our work as we are being as transparent as possible with our po um, the packets on the website. And um, I just hope that you guys continue to engage with us and help lead our work. Thank you so much, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I'll echo everyone else, I, you know, your participation, everyone who is here today is invaluable to our work. And I appreciate both those who shared and those who came to listen. Uh, I think it's part of building community. Uh, and I would ask that you all spread the word that we have an online 
uh, survey and input tool uh, where anyone can answer these questions, share stories, and give us um, useful information. Uh, please spread the word about that. It's available through the town website, uh, and we'd like to get more input even than this. Mm -hmm. Agreed. See, this is the very reason why I ask other people to speak, so I don't have to say so much at the end. I think whatever they just said is exactly reflects my sentiments as well. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to reflect again our, our appreciation for Ms. Moyston spending an additional time yes. to uh, help us facilitate this and certainly Mr. Hannon for his technical expertise um, behind the scenes here for helping us get up and motivated. And um, I, uh, I, you know, respect to the survey, I mean, I'd like to maybe just maybe mention, you know, I don't know if you want to mention it, uh, Ms. Moyston, but I think people are responding to the survey. I don't know if you want to make a comment or a, a plug for doing that as well, in addition to what was just said. Sure. So we do have um, residents completing the survey. It is important for us to have as many people as we can possibly have complete the survey. Um, so if you know people who weren't able to come and they have some input for us, we would greatly appreciate it. All input is valuable, none is too small, whether it's positive or negative, it is all very valuable and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And, and we're uh, you know a little over our time here. So I'll just move ready to, in terms of upcoming events, any upcoming events we need to know about relative to the community or, um, you know, what's going on in our community. I want to backtrack a little bit and, and thank again, Ms. Moyston and others for uh, promoting and uh, advertising the events relative to, uh, related to the uh, MLK celebration and um, all of those things. I want to just encourage people to attend to the, uh, the, the, the website uh, announcements that are going on, a lot that's going on in the town at this point. So I know there's a lot in the world happening. So I you know, both appreciate people's attention to it and encourage you to continue to pay attention to all the aspects of town government that are going on because I think they're 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 not separate. The, these things are are systemically related, and I think you if you can stay connected to all the different committees and what they're doing to whatever extent you can, I'd appreciate that as well as with the committee. Um, any, uh, any upcoming events, folks? Well, not hearing it. Clarify. Yeah. Yes. Can we clarify when the next meeting of this group is? What a great segue. That's the next, that's the agenda item next. Oh, <laughs> Let me first uh, throw my, uh, a caveat in here. Ms. Moyston sent an email to me on Thursday uh, saying that because of the holiday, we had to have agenda items on uh, available to her to post on Friday. My systems were not working well. And I notified her later today. I, all of a sudden got a barrage of emails that came in after the fact and one of those was hers. So I missed an opportunity to post an agenda for Wednesday's meeting, which I think we were speaking about, which, which begs the question of when would our next meeting be? And I'm asking the committee to possibly consider Thursday or Friday for a meeting um, simply because a lot has gone on in the past week. We've met three times we met on Monday, we met Wednesday, we met Saturday uh, today in terms of our, um, our forum. And we received a ton of feedback from our, our community. So if we could get a meeting in on Thursday or Friday of this week, um, my apologies again, but if we could make that accommodation, um, that would be great. We can get some more of our work done and do some updates into some things that we need to follow up that we've if asked for previously. 
this if morning. Easy, mm -hmm. If it's easier, I can send a, dent, a doodle poll out on Tuesday, if that helps at all. I don't know. Well, since I said what I said, I'm I'm open to whatever the, the, the group would like to do. If if the doodle poll is something that would be easier for folks to manage at this point in time, uh, given that it's like 5.15 on a Saturday. I think Ms. Pat had her hand up. Ms. Pat had her hand up. Excuse me? Yeah, yeah I'm agreeing with um, Ms. Marston because we don't have Darius tonight. And he, he had come at the time. Uh, basketball or something like that. So yes. yeah, I think we should you know, go with what Ms. Marston just suggested. If does it, everyone else agree with that, if, if Ms. Moisey could send out a quick doodle poll and we can give her a really quick turnaround response to that, we can set up a, and perhaps uh, Ms. Moisey, you could offer, you know, Thursday and Friday meeting times. Um, and then I, I see Ms. Ms. Walker and then Mr. Vernon Jones has their, have their hands up. Ms. Walker, first, please. Um, so I'm okay with doing a doodle poll for our next meeting date, but I'm wondering if we have suggestions for things we'd like to add to the agenda um, when we should get them to the chair by. Um, if if we were going to have the meeting, if we were to have the meeting on Thursday, I think Ms. Moisten needs them on Tuesday. If we were to get those those have a meeting on Friday, we need to get those agenda items to her on Wednesday. I've already suggested a few items to her but they were received late, unfortunately. And I'd be happy to share those with the group if you'd like to see what I've suggested. And I would absolutely welcome and encourage any other agenda items that are not on my list uh, for the agenda on whichever day we have the meeting. And you can send those items to me now if you would like between now and Tuesday, Wednesday so that I just have them. Would so we agreed that we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll respond. To, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. Vernon Jones, you did have your hand up. Oh, my, I'm just asking about timeline. If we were going to meet Thursday, when would that meeting need to be posted? Tuesday. Tuesday. So a Tuesday doodle is... I mean, I have to send it out. I mean, I can send one Very out tight on, timeline. It is tight, but, or you guys can just decide now if you would like it. I'm ready to decide now. I, I don't, we don't have Darius. And I think Miss uh, Miss oh. Miss Pat's comment about Darius not being here yeah. is significant because he is an integral part of our committee. Mr. I mean, we, could, we could just we could just have see if what most people are available, you know, and then and then Miss Moisson can check with with uh, Mr. Cage. Okay. Yep. So are, we thinking, are we thinking Friday at five thirty? Both days are good for me, Thursday and Friday, I'm flexible. I'm available. I can also be really flexible, so whatever works best for you guys. Yeah, I can do Thursday or Friday at 5.30. Okay, yeah. are we gonna keep the same meeting time for 5.30? Time-wise, I think, and I'm speaking for people who are, you know, have seen 5.30 as an as entry point for these, these types of meetings as being the, the sort of the standard. Um, 5.30 either day could work for me. Friday is better for me than Thursday. Tashina? Tashina? Let me just... Uh... It doesn't matter to me. Okay. So let me let me suggest five thirty at uh, on Friday, and that we get our our agenda items to um, Ms. Moiston. I would I would suggest tomorrow morning, and um, I will take responsibility for reading out reaching out to to Mr. Cage. Thank you. Does that that sit well with everyone? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so in just keeping with the uh, so we'll we'll do we'll do that, and in keeping with the agenda, our so we've established our next meeting is to be determined, and it it we already did it. We're going to say five thirty on Friday. Uh, we'll get agenda items to uh, Ms. Moisten 
uh, by tomorrow morning, and that'll be posted. Um, any other topics that did not come before uh, the, the chair within 48 hours? Okay, hearing, hearing none, I, I'd like to make a comment. Be, oh, okay, Ms. 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 Pat. Sorry, so I have a clarifying question around the gift certificate that we're supposed to send suggestion and comment rationale around um, folks who come out to, to testify. Um, I started doing that, but I felt that this is a discussion that needs to happen openly, like if we send suggestions to Ms. Marston, um, is that where it ends? Like we don't, we're not going to have discussion on it or? or just, I, I, let me just, I know. apologize. I didn't hear the first part of what so, you're concerned about. So what I'm concerned about is when we raise the, you know, how much uh, gift certificate should we give to people who come out to testify in this open forum? And I thought about sending uh, my input to Ms. Moistin, but I changed my mind because I just want people to, for all of us to discuss it openly. This is uh -oh. a good opportunity, I would think at this point to, to send it to her as an agenda item for this coming week, because we do have to deliberate that and we, sh we should do it publicly. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to, to do that, Ms. Pat, to send that uh, to Ms. Moiston. I think that's actually one of the things that was uh, embedded in one of my, my agenda items as well. Okay. I so just, just in support of what you're saying, I think it's important for us to know. Ms. Walker, you had your hand up? I was just also going to suggest that we add that to the agenda for our next meeting. I would say any agenda items and, you know, you know and please certainly give some thought to, um, you know, to that, I, I want to remind you too that if there are um, uh, other pieces of information you want to include in the packet for us to consider, that those also should be sent to Ms. Moisten on a regular basis because they become part of our, our, our working documents going forward. I do want to say, um, I, I should have mentioned in terms of upcoming events, and I apologize, I want to go backtrack, but. Uh, Ms. Owen and I appeared on the uh, 12 noon uh, community chat. This, uh, what day was that, Ms. Moiston? I mean, Ms. Uh, Ms. Owen? I want to say it was Wednesday, the 13th, maybe, or was it Thursday? Your days are merging just like mine are, aren't they, Ms. Owen? Day, every day since COVID has felt like a Wednesday. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you, but yeah. we were invited um, to represent the group. Um, oh my God, that's really strange. I can't remember, it did, it's really moving so fast. But the two of us spent uh, a half hour on the community chat, which is done in 12. What is that, Ms. Moisten? It's, 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 it was yesterday, wasn't chat? it? No. No, I think it was Thursday. That's Thursday. what uh, Mr. Bachman had said. Thursday at 12, because I knew like he had invited a bunch of us and I know I always have a meeting at that time, so. Oh my God. Well, I heard we did a good job. On behalf of the the the, gr the group, and uh, I would encourage you to you know if you get a chance to take a look at it, uh, please tell me what day it was if you figure that out. I would be really happy to know that. But um, I was appreciative of the fact that both Miss Miss Owen and I were there together. I do want to let the um, uh, the group know as well as the community that uh, town council is meeting on January twenty fifth. And uh, both uh, Ms. Ms. Owen and, and myself will be on that meeting as well to talk about the work of the Community Service Working Group. So perhaps at our next meeting, if you have any comments relative to that in terms of our input, we'd be happy to receive that. And I wanted to say we'd be honored to represent you all at the Town Council to give some more exposure to our work going forward. But just wanted to let you know that uh, we're being asked by the town to be there and we've agreed to be there. Um, and I, I, I just wanna say, and Ms. Owen, you can certainly add into this at any time, of course, but I, I think the presence of both 
Ms. Ms. Owen and I um, have a very powerful presence in terms of representing the group. Let me just put it that way. And um, I, I think our combined contributions to questions and uh, interfacing with the community has been very, you know, very strong as a result of our our collaboration together as com community working group members. So, Ms. Owen, I. Oh, I agree. I agree. I agree, Paul. I really, I, Mr. Wiley, I really enjoy working with you, and I I'm just excited to be part of this group. And um, I thought the community chat also went really well. Um, if nothing else comes out of this group, maybe more community engagement. I guess. Well, thank so you how, all. I'm sorry. So how do we access the community chat on website? The community chat. The community chats. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's an actual a link for the. The website. We can send you the link. Okay. It was fabulous, by the way, Miss Pat. Said it again. It was fabulous. Oh, good. Thank you, you guys. So you don't, you don't have to look. You don't have to go look at it. I will. I word for it. <laughs> Thank you all for for all your hard work, and um, I appreciate the time and effort you're making to be here. I would like to take a motion to adjourn our meeting for this evening. I move to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Ms. Ferreira, uh, seconded. during the meeting, seconded by uh, Ms. Pat. Uh, all those in favor, you can just wave your hand. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. And uh, we will see you on screen next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good rest of the weekend. Bye, everyone. So, uh, hold on. Um.